Morris, a professor at the International Affairs School at the University of Denver. He's written, I want to say it's 14 books now? 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. He's, working on, he's working on lucky number 13 and maybe another one down the pipeline. Uh, he is famously the dissertation advisor of former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, but not just her. Uh, he's advised um, many students over the years, and I think that Professor Edelman's uh, network that he's built over the years, uh, having gotten to know him over the past couple of years, is truly remarkable, and I think it impacts a lot of uh, the knowledge he has and the information that he's going to be able to present to you, as you'll see. Uh, the other important thing to mention is that uh, Jonathan has really traveled extensively throughout the world. Uh, he's been, uh, I think the number was 14, or maybe now it's 15. 18. 18, sorry. He needs to update his bio a little bit. But uh, 18 State Department uh, sponsored trips to different countries. He just came back from Latin America, actually. Uh, and because we're on the subject of tonight's event, he's been to China over 20 times and is now uh, thinking about the next time he's going to go. So I think that this network, uh, this network that he has, coupled with the extensive experiences on the ground in many of these countries uh, really comes together to form a unique set of information. And a lot of people come to campuses speaking about different programs and, and different types of topics, but it's, it's not often that we have somebody who uh, has really been on the ground and has spoken to the people that are making a lot of the decisions. So I think you'll find that uh, fascinating. And on a personal level, I've gotten to know uh, Dr. Aylman over the last three years uh, pretty well. And I, I can tell you that he's one of the most intelligent and insightful thinkers on topics relating to the Middle East and Asia and the United States. And he's also become a uh, personal friend. And I think that um, the most important thing on his resume that needs to be mentioned is that he got not one, not two, but three degrees from Columbia. Four. Uh, Four. <laughs> they give you an MPhil and you pass your times. Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> we don't do much with it. Yeah, well, the three main ones are his, his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD, of course, while well, many of us are struggling just to get one. Uh, here he has four. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce somebody who really has the Columbia Light Blue uh, in his heart. Um, so please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Real. Well, I feel I should sit down after that introduction. So <laughs> what more can we add? But today we're going to talk about Israel and Asia. And this seems on the surface to be a most unlikely topic. Because in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the times when I was here in the 60s and the 70s, this topic really didn't exist. Because Israel, as late as 1988, did not have diplomatic relations with the countries representing the majority of people in the world. And indeed, as late as 1988, Israel had diplomatic relations with only 85 countries out of 180 countries in the world. So our topic today is one that refers to a, a diplomatic revolution that has occurred in the last 20 years. But we need to start at the beginning. And we need to think a little bit about Israeli history. And when we think about it, we remember the words of Menachem Begin. And when Menachem Begin was Prime Minister of Israel, one of the things he used to say was, Oi, the Goyim hate us. Nobody in the world loves us. We are all alone. And of course, he was a product of the Holocaust generation. And that's where we need to start to really understand what's going on. We need to think, because Bernard Lewis often tells us, and I was very fortunate at lunch with Bernard Lewis a couple of years ago, and he absolutely wows you when you say to him, so, Professor Lewis, you know, he's only 92 years old, he, he says, so when was the first time you went to the Middle East? And he scratches his head and says, oh, it was 1937. And so, it, it was amazing. But what is powerful was, he talks about how today, with the Iranian nuclear threat, for Israel, it's 1938 all over again. And we need to think about that for a second, because it's very relevant to our topic. Because what happened in 1938 wasn't simply the awareness of the oncoming Holocaust that would start within the next two years. What was also powerful was the incredible isolation of the Zionist movement in Palestine, as well as the Jewish community around the world. In 1938, there was the famous, or should we say infamous, Evian Conference. And at that conference, 35 states came together to decide what they would do with Jewish refugees, should they take them. 34 of those states said, no, we don't want any. 
including the United States, which refused to even take kinder transport, as the British did with 10,000 young German Jewish children. The United States didn't even want that. A Saturday evening postponed in 1938 found that 83% of Americans were against taking European refugees. So when Nachum Begin talks about they hated us, there was no place to go with the famous Bermuda Conference in 1943, there really was no place to go. These were the people that were looking for external help, for allies anywhere around the world. At the Evian Conference, only the Dominican Republic said that they would take them, and they later backed off. So it's against that backdrop that when Israel was born in 1948, it was so grateful for the support from the United States, but the reality was that even countries like England, which had very reluctantly agreed to hand over the mandate, were busy selling weapons to Iraq and to Transjordan, and even more, Sir John Glove Pasha was actually commanding the Jordanian Arab Legion on the other side. So it's against that we need to remember something else that's very important historically. And that I learned when I was in Israel at the foreign ministry. And one of the things that was fascinating is because China is one of my areas, we got into a very long discussion of Israeli relations with China. And what was pointed out to me was that Israel had always favored China. And this is important to understand. Israel began, and even today, has significant socialist features. And in 1950, you remember in June 1950, when North, when North Korea invaded the South, and the United States asked for the United Nations mandate to support intervention into the Korean War. The United States came to Israel and said, we want you to contribute a you know, group of Israeli soldiers to fight on our side. And the United States, led by Goldman and Gears, said, no, we're a socialist country. We're not going to do that. So when I went to the Chinese foreign ministry in Beijing, we had a discussion about all of this. They said, absolutely. Israel and China, from the very beginning, were planning on diplomatic relations. And in fact, by the end of 1952, had gone so far in this that they already had figured out what building the Israelis would have. And the Israelis were going to officially recognize the People's Republic of China as a fellow socialist country. But in January 1953, something very important happened. Dwight Eisenhower became the President of the United States. But much more interesting was his Secretary of State, who was Dulles. John, got to get it right, it's John Foster Dulles, because it's Alan Dulles, his brother, who was the head of the CIA. But you're right, it is Dulles. And John Foster Dulles got wind that the Israelis, as this is the told in Beijing, learned that the Israelis planned to break an American boycott by recognizing it. And John Foster Dulles called up David Ben-Gurion and in no uncertain terms told them he had a choice. They could recognize the People's Republic of China, they could open their embassy, and if they decided to do that, he was going to make sure the United Jewish Appeal would no longer have a charitable tax-free status in the United States. In those days, they desperately needed the money, unlike today. So they decided not to do it. But Israel never went along with supporting those who were opposed to China. And so, again, in the 1970s, that relationship began all over again. So what's powerful is to ask the simple question, why, in the last 20 years, have we seen this diplomatic revolution? Because when we look at Israel today, we see a beleaguered country. We see a country that is worried about an existential threat from Iran, from Iran getting nuclear weapons. And the Iranians have made very clear in recent weeks and they've talked, of course, about, well, we'll build 10 more, you know, uranium processing plants, or we're going to give $20 million 